أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Our respected viewers, my respected scholars with me joining here today Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa barakatuh Firstly, on behalf of the Africa Federation and the AFTAB committees, I would like to welcome you all to this Majlis Etazia in remembrance of Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Sayyid Al Hakim. Let us take this opportunity to remember his blessed life and begin this Majlis Aza with the recitation of the Holy Quran. And for that, I would like to invite Sheikh Abdul Razak to lead us in the holy words of the holy quran bismillah shaykh a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem wa ma kana al mu'minun فلولا نفر من كل فرقة منهم طائفة من كل فرقة منهم طائفة ليتفقه في الدين ليتفقه في الدين ولينذر قومه إذا رجعوا إليهم لعلهم يحذرون وما كان المؤمنون لينفروا فلولا نفر من كل فرقة منهم طائفة ليتفقه في ليتفقه في الدين ولينذر قومهم إذا رجعوا وَلِيُنْذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ the 
guide of the Holy Quran that we can most of the time get our our knowledge from but it is very very important to keep in mind that there are those who have been tasked just as the uh, the verses that Sheikh Abdul Razak read that there are those who have been tasked with going forth from every community and going and learning Islamic knowledge the value of a scholar in Islam is something that we may often not take notice of mainly because of the humble nature that the true ulema deen possess and the simple life that they live but rest assured that these individuals are those ones who take the heavy burden of understanding Islam for what it truly is. They spend decades engrossed in books, tafsir of the Holy Quran, ahadith, texts and teachings. They discuss, they learn, and then they take the heavier task of taking their knowledge and condensing it to be able to spread to the masses like you and I. One such individual is Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Sayyid Al-Hakim. I would like to take this opportunity now to invite Sheikh Dr. Murtaza Ali Dina to enlighten us further on the role of ulama -e deen in Islam. With that, I would like to request you all to welcome Sheikh Ali Dina with a loud salawat. Ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhna. Karib. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam jami'an wa rahmatullah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani ar-rajim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين respected elders scholars brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. We thank the uh, organizers for this program to pay tribute to one of the great maraji' of taqlid of our time, Hazrat Ayatullah al-Uzma, Sayyid Muhammad Sa'id, Taba Taba'i al-Hakim. Indeed, the uh, Quran teaches us that we should remember the great models and personalities in the history of Islam and in our current times so that they become models for guidance. So, so for example, in Surah Mubarakah Maryam, Allah announces وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ in ayah number 41 وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مُوسَى ayah number 51 وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلِ ayah number 54 وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِدْرِيسِ ayah 56 and it gives the reasons that these were great prophets, each had his own unique contribution in the scheme of God to guide mankind. So, for example, Ibrahim alayhi salam, innahu kana siddiqan nabiyya. He was the most truthful, he was a prophet of God. Musa alayhi salam, because innahu kana mukhlisan. وَكَانَ رَسُولًا نَبِيًّا He was sincere and exclusively devoted to God and he was a messenger and a prophet of God. And therefore, the commemoration 
and paying tribute to the Marajir as models who are continuing the path of the prophets is also important. If the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa alihi has been sent to guide mankind, who alladhi ba'atha fil ummiyyina rasoolan minhum yatlu alayhim ayatih wa yuzakihim wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab wal hikmah that he has raised from amongst you mankind and the primary audience in which the Prophet was sent to so that he may proclaim and recite unto them the special messages of God and the signs of God and so that he may spiritually transform and train and discipline and so that he may teach and explain and expound the laws of God and the deeper wisdom and the secrets of the universe to mankind. After the Prophet, this task was continued through the godly appointed Imams of the Ahlul Bayt and in the absence of the 12th living Imam Ajjalallahu Faraja, it is the Maraji' of Taqlid who perform this great prophetic task. And therefore, it is important that we pay due tribute to these great Maraji'. Hazrat Ayatollah Hakim played a crucial role in his time, in our contemporary times, to guide the Ummah. Essentially, we need to recognize that the community of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, the body of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt has a head and a heart and that is the, the Hawza, the Hawza of the holy city in Najaf, the Hawza in the holy city of Qom, where the top experts and scholars of the mezhab of Ahlul Bayt السلام, are studying and teaching and preaching and gradually rising in expertise, in academic knowledge, in understanding the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, till they reach the higher echelons and the top academic level, till then they are identified by the experts to become the marja, qualified, certified, worthy to be followed by the body and the Shia community. So this head of the body of the Shia world and this heart of the body of the Shia world, it is governed by these marajir. And therefore, we need to recognize their important uh, role. In uh, the dua of Nudba, which inshallah we shall be reciting tomorrow Friday in connecting to the Imam of our time, we say that, O oh Allah, we praise you that you have decreed for the guidance of mankind certain people that you have selected. Allahumma lakal hamdu ala ma jara bihi qada'uka fi awliya'ik alladhina istakhlastahum linafsik wa deenik. O Allah, you have selected certain people and purified them so that they are exclusively devoted to you and you alone. They do not follow or worship anything other than you. And therefore they serve nothing but you and your deen. إِذِ اخْتَرْتَ لَهُمْ جَزِيلَ مَا عِنْدَكَ مِنَ النَّعِيمِ الْمُقِيمِ And how is it that you have selected them to become the representatives on the earth for your deen? 
so uh, the dua says because they are totally devoted to you and they are not distracted and they are not attached We do apologize. Uh, it seems uh, Sheikh is experiencing a bit of technical difficulties. Um, and so while we wait for him to rejoin. Sorry, okay. uh, uh, I don't know where I got uh, disconnected. No worries, Sheikh. So in Dua Nudba, we are reminded that Allah has selected these servants to be exclusively devoted to him because they are detached from anything and everything other than God. And one of the biggest sources of distraction is the dunya. It's the decorations of the dunya, the lowly pleasures of the dunya. But they have transcended. They have ascended to a higher level where they are devoted totally to God. بَعْدَ أَنْ شَرَطَّ عَلَيْهِمُ الزُّهُدْ فِي دَرَجَاتِ and they have committed themselves to you and you alone and they have detached themselves from the dunya. And so one of the qualities, essential qualifying, certifying quality of the maraji' is that they are totally detached from the lowly pleasures of the dunya and they live a simple life despite having access to tremendous financial resources and the potential for material pleasures and it's interesting marhum ayatullah said hakim himself in explaining the qualifying condition of the marja he says the marja has to be adil and he has to avoid sins. But this adala which is required for the marja is not the ordinary adala, for example, that is required, let's say, for a pesh imam in a masjid. Rather, uh, if a pesh imam, let's say, uh, avoids gunahi kabira, and uh, let's say he does gunahi saghira, that is still acceptable from him. But for a marja, no, not even a gunahi saghira should be performed and if a marja uh, god forbid in his efforts to avoid gunahi saghira occasionally commits that he must immediately repent and return back to god and then he explains the reason for that is that the marja occupies a much higher position uh, and therefore has the highest responsibility and because he faces tremendous pressures for distraction away from God. It could be the pressure of fame. It could be the pressure of the excessive material uh, possessions of the dunya that he is entrusted with by the followers. It could be the pressure of uh, political authorities who may try to pressurize and persuade them to issue fatwas in their favor. It could be even the pressure from the public who have expectations from the maraji'ah to issue fatwas which is for their convenience but which the marja has determined not to be the true fatwa according to the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. It could be the pressures um, uh, uh, at the intellectual level. Mahom said Hakim says that a marja may be under certain intellectual tendencies where which can influence his logical deductive processes whereby he may want to therefore justify and look in the Qur'an and the Hadith and the other sources a justification if he is not controlled with this high level of taqwa and adala and zuhud, these worldly pressures. And therefore we need to recognize the huge sacrifices that the maraja have to make in order to reach that level and to be able to maintain themselves at that high level. And therefore, it's interesting that you will notice that in the history of the Maraja, the family of Sayyid al-Hakim, be it from the grandfather, Sayyid, uh, actually it was the grand uncle, 
marhum said muhsan al hakim uh, his family his children his grandchildren and his other relatives many of them were uh, harassed were arrested were tortured and many were even executed by the despotic regime of uh, saddam hussein and one of them who was arrested was uh, mahmoud said muhammad saeed al hakim himself and he spent almost nine years in uh, prison but this fact that he was pressurized but he did not succumb and did not issue any fatwa in favor of the despotic regime and preferred to go to prison it reminded me of this prophetic seerah nabi yusuf alayhi salam in the quran was under tremendous pressure yusuf alayhi salam faced pressure from his own brothers he faced pressure from that powerful wife of the aziz al misr the the temptations and the passion he faced the uh, pressures of um, the power that he got later on in misr he faced the pressures of uh, once he was released from prison to go back to his father rather he stayed in misr and he guided misr he faced tremendous pressures but he resisted and the reason he gives is as mentioned in surah yusuf is qala rabbi as-sijnu ahabbu ilayya mimma yad'unani ilayhi o allah they are trying to pressurize me to succumb to a sinful behavior be it in the palace be it elsewhere but for me to serve you even be it in the prison without any of the comforts that i'm enjoying in the palace that is much better for me to be in prison than to continue to be sinful as a apparently free man in the palace marhum said muhammad saeed al hakim is a prime example of a situation where he had to undergo severe torture i don't know for those of you who may have had the opportunity to have visited him alhamdulillah we um, with the delegation of the federations and uh, uh, also on private occasions we had the opportunity to go and visit the marhum in his lifetime it was very sad to see him the way he would walk in fact I, I, you may even look for a video where he has come out for the arba'in walk he could not walk even properly because of the torture that he had suffered and the beatings on the back on the leg and he was essentially disabled but the man did not succumb to the pressure of the zalimin and he and he withstood the oppressors and resisted them and the interesting thing is that this marja even inside the prison continued with his work of teaching and training despite the severe restrictions in the prison so just like yusuf alayhi salam preaches to his co-prisoners and invites them towards god so also the co-prisoners many of them were his own family uh, relatives and the other youths who were arrested by saddam's regime they report that we used to go to see it say it in the prison was a pillar of comfort and solace and encouragement for us say it used to conduct high level ijtihad classes inside the prison and uh, he used to even write whatever with whatever meager facilities he had in the prison and uh, there are books that lay, were later on published which began in the prison books in usul fiqh for example books in history interesting he is one of the maraji who also wrote about history the history for example of karbala and of imam hussein ali salam which was printed in the name of fajiat al taf and uh, in fact surprising till the end of his life he continued teaching and writing 
and training uh, mujtahids. And uh, it's only about one, one and a half years before his untimely demise, during the corona in pandemic that classes had to be stopped. Even during that time when the classes stopped, he continued writing. He started writing another history book, the Seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ali. In fact, one of his students says that he was so hardworking and he was so humble that um, he says if you calculate per year the number of classes that he used to give of training mujtahids, it is even more than the number of classes you would expect for a university student. And uh, he was so humble that though he had, it, it was almost in the last years of his life, at the peak of his marja'iyya, he, he wrote that book and then he shares the manuscript with a couple of his students. He says, go through it and if you feel that there are, and I would welcome your comments if you feel there is some uh, scope for improvement. Alhamdulillah, Sayyid Marhum, Sayyid Muhammad Saeed, Al-Hakim as a marja. He has a long list of books that he has published to his credit. But as a marja, because of the long suffering that he underwent, because of the experience and closeness with the masses, he would be very close to the masses, accessible to the ordinary man on the street. And if a person wanted to go and visit him, despite the advice being given to him by the office bearers, by the uh, doctors that you have to reduce your contacts, but he would say, no, I have to be able to be accessible and available to these ordinary people who have undergone a huge suffering for the sake of Islam. The marja was very close to the youths. He had seen hundreds and thousands in the prisons. And they considered him as their spiritual father, the way he, he cared for them, even in, in, in those hard prison times. And uh, later on in his marja'iyya, he uh, reached out to the needy masses. There are lots of humanitarian projects that he left behind, the orphanage where tens of thousands of yatims were being taken care of the families of the shuhada during the difficult times of uh, the history where the Iraqi people had to undergo. But I would like to uh, share one very important quality, which is again a prophetic quality, where the leader and the, the marja connects to the people in such a way that for him, the concern for and the care for the ordinary people is more than the care and concern for his self-comfort. So uh, an interesting uh, report uh, was narrated whereby uh, some person from the Gulf countries comes to visit him and sees him in the hot summer weather of Najaf and uh, says that, Sayyid, you, you don't even have the proper cooling facilities let me arrange for an air conditioner for you. And he said that, no, I can afford, but I will not want an air conditioner if my neighbor here cannot afford it. And, and this response, and he said that, I don't know if I, if I get the facility of air conditioner and my neighbor does not have it, then what answer am I going to give to my grandmother, Bizahra alayhi salam, on the day of judgment. This is the, the, the Fatima Zahra who trained her children that al jar thumma dar. First, you should show concern for your neighbor, then you should attend to yourself. And for him, the mu'mineen in general were like his close family to whom he showed concern. In fact, during the uh, political persecution of uh, Saddam, he developed a, a medical problem which needed treatment with, and the facilities were not available inside Iraq at that time. So they got permission to take him abroad 
to to the apparently to the United Kingdom. But it so happened that it was around the time when uh, some of the world powers were planning an attack on uh, Saddam to overthrow his regime. So a message was sent to Sayyid that you are abroad, you have undergone your medical treatment, you seem to be well, but do, we are advising you strongly that do not go back to Iraq because the situation is precarious. We don't know what is going to happen. And it will be safer for you to stay here till the war is over and the situation becomes clear. And his response was very simple. He said that I cannot stay here in the comfort outside Iraq when our brethren in Iraq are suffering. I cannot desert them in this time of crisis. This will affect their morale. And this, this reminds, me, uh, reminds us of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. The simple food that he used to have. And when his family would say that you should have a little better food than this simplest of the food that you are taking. And he would say that no, perhaps in one part of the, of the Muslim world. There will be someone man la who, who, who may not have even a loaf of bread to eat. I cannot be called Amirul Mu'mineen when there are some in the Ummah who could be suffering. Marja'iyya and leadership is not only to be the top expert in the academic field, but also to be at the highest level of sacrifice of devotion to God, of caring for the people, of putting the comfort of others over one's personal comfort. And therefore, one of the biggest concerns he had also was sometimes the uh, reports that were reaching him that there are some so-called uh, scholars out there who are claiming that Islam should produce uh, different fatwa, or different teachings and uh, he would say to these people who are opposing the mainstream that it is important that if you have academic differences of opinion that these differences of opinion are brought to the Hausa for discussion and they are not raised amongst the ordinary masses. It's not that the Hausa and the Maraja do not have answers to the apparent objections that are being raised, but the forum and the platform for raising alternative opinions is not amongst the ordinary untrained masses. And it is not to twist the sources, Islamic sources, to issue fatwas which appear to be convenient and comfortable for some people. And he firmly believed that there has been no serious corruption or fabrication in the Hadith literature. He said, we had the guidance of the Imams for 200 years, beginning from Amir al till the period of Ghaiba, almost three centuries during which the A'imma alayhimu salam carefully, closely trained, trusted companions who recorded the hadith, who transmitted the hadith. They were overseen by the imams. They were polished, they were refined, and they were brought to a level where enough tools and resources were given to the Shia leadership that now there is enough for you to be able to, in the period of Ghaiba, to be able to refer to the original sources and to be able to get the necessary guidance from the hadith literature. This was his, his personal belief and he has stated that clearly. One of the fundamental achievements of Karbala was that the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt began a vast campaign of education, of educating the, the, the future generations because the Ummah saw when you go to the wrong leadership, the wrong leadership can lead the masses to come out and kill the grandson of the Prophet. The true Islam had to be, and, and there were enough people 
now ready to listen and to be trained and and therefore the true Islam could be transmitted to the next generation with the proper teachings and the safeguards how to avoid corruption and fabrication in the sources and to give the necessary tools and resources for the ulama, for the fuqaha, for the maraji' to be able to derive the necessary guidance for the ummah till up, up until such time then when the ummah is ready to receive the imam who is in ghaibah. May Allah bless the soul of this great marja. And, and may Allah give his special care and attention to the living maraji' And may Allah always keep this love of Ahlul Bayt alive in our hearts, the way it was alive in the heart of Sayyid Mahum Sayyid al-Hakim. Till the last years of his life, he made an effort, despite his ability and illness, he would come out personally to walk in the Arba'in March. That, that love for Ahlul Bayt was there. And when he was told, Sayyid, but you are not in a position to come out now because of a health situation, he says, if Imam Hussein salam could give away his life, what am I to take a little trouble to come out and participate in the walk? These are our marajir. May Allah bless their soul. May Allah keep the love of Ahlul Bayt always alive and keep us connected to them. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Ahsantum shaykh. Thank you very much for those enlightening words and uh, for giving us an outlook into the life of Sayyid al-Hakim. To further our uh, information and our knowledge and our insight into this great, great marja, I would like to now um, bring our attention to a recorded clip that we have from a member of the al-Hakim family who is going to be taking us through uh, more in depth into the life of Sayyid Al Hakim? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alam. Ala Alihi, Atayibin, Atahirin. Will be dying at Akadem. أحر التعازي إلى ساحة سيدنا ومولانا صاحب العصر والزمان ولا عموم مراجعنا العظام ولا جميع شيعة أهل البيت عليهم السلام الذين فجعوا بهذا الحادث الأليم نتقدم لهم جميعا بالتعزي أولا وثانيا نتقدم لكم إخواننا بالشكر الجزيل لمساهمتكم ومشاركتكم في هذه المجالس التي يراد بها التي يراد بها إحياء ذكر هذا السيد الجليل الذي قدم الكثير من التضحيات من أجل خدمة أهل البيت صلوات الله وسلامه عليهم أجمعين بالنسبة إلى الحديث إلى عن سماحة السيد المرحوم قدس الروح هناك مجالات كثيرة للحديث وبما أن الوقت لا يسمح لنا كثيرا فنحن نعتذر منكم مقدما ونتقدم ببعض الجوانب التي يمكن أن تتضح منها ملامح عمل وجهاد وتضحية هذا الرجل الذي كانت حياته كلها عملا وكلها علما وكلها صبرا وكانت كلها إيمانا بالله وثقة بالله تعالى من خصائص هذا الرجل أنه ابتدأ حياته العلمية مبكرا وبرعاية المرحوم السيد والده السيد محمد علي قدس سره الشريف وأيضا برعاية جده السيد الحكيم قدس سره الذي كان يعتبره بمثابة أحد أولاده لأنه كان مقاربا لهم لأولاده في العمر يعني تام الثقة بالله تعالى في أنه الله سبحانه وتعالى لن يتخلى عن عباده إذا كان مخلصا لا يتخلى عن هذا هم أيضا من الجوانب المهمة في شخصية هذا الرجل وبالفعل تعرض هذا الرجل إلى في محطات كثيرة من حياته تعرض إلى ضغوط غير طبيعية قضية 
ما تعرض له في زمن النظام البائد من اضطهاد وظلم أنه كان في سجون النظام البائد مع مجموعة العائلة في ذلك الوقت وقضى في ذلك السجن حوالي ثماني سنوات لكن في كل تلك المراحل وما بعدها وما قبلها والابتلاء الشديد الذي كان يحيط بالشعب العراقي عموما وبطلبة العلوم الدينية خصوصا كان قوي الإيمان وواثقا بالله تعالى من أن كل ما يمكن أن يمر به المؤمن فهو بعين الله وتحت رعايته وكان سبحانه وتعالى لن يتخلى عن هذه الطائفة المحقة عن شيعة أهل البيت عليهم السلام ومهما كانت النتائج وكان يقول لا نعلم من يخرج من هذه الابتلاءات سالما أو لا يخرج منها سالما لكني على يقين انت بأن الله سبحانه وتعالى سينصر التشيع وسينصر هذا الخط خط أهل البيت عليهم السلام لأن كل المؤشرات وكل الدلالات تدل على ذلك هذا هم أيضا من جوانب شخصيته المهمة من جوانبها من بعض جوانب شخصيته المهمة أيضا أنه كان لا يدع وقتا يفوته ب يعني بالهدر لا يسمح لأن يذهب شيء من وقته هدرا بلا وفي كثير من الحالات كان لا يفوت فرصة حتى ولو كانت قليلة في أن يفتح كتابا أو يقرأ فيه وربما يصل الحال كان في أيام شبابه ربما يصل الحال أنه يفتح الكتاب وهو على مائدة الطعام أو قبل النوم وأمثال ذلك وكان أيضا لا يتوانى عن متابعة البحث العلمي وخصوصا في هذه المحنة الأخيرة أيام الوباء الذي حل بعموم العالم وتعطلت الدروس وانقطعت المواصلات وقل الحضور الناس معه وبين يديه واختلائه في بيته لم يترك فرصة إلا وعمل إلا وجد واجتهد في أن يعمل وأن يكون منتجا ومثمرا وكان آخرها أنه عمل على تأليف كتاب عن النبي صلى الله عليه وآله في هذه الأيام الأخيرة في أيام وباء الكورونا وأكمل الكتاب وقدمه إلى الطبع وتوفي رضوان الله عليه قبل أن تصله النسخ المطبوعة من هذا الكتاب وحتى في ظروف السجن الصعبة لم يترك فرصة إلا وحاول أن يستفيد منها فقد حاول بشكل أو بآخر أن يتابع كتاباته ودروسه حتى في ذلك الوقت العسر ومع انقطاع كل المصادر فقد حاول أن يكتب بعض المؤلفات على ذاكرته وقد درس بعض تلك الكتب وكتب مقتل الإمام الحسين عليه السلام ليتلى على يعني على الإخوة على السائر العائل الذين كانوا معه في تلك الغرف المظلمة في السجن ليتلى عليهم مقتل الإمام الحسين وعلى الذاكرة وكذلك كتب ما ما استطاع أن يتذكره من ثم لما تصدى لشؤون المرجعية وذلك بعد بعد صد بشكل كان يعني لم لم يحاول أن يجعل من مرجعيته شيئا من الشبهة أو الشك أو التواصل مع النظام السابق أو بعض الأساليب التي قد تستخدم في حالات التنافس وأمثال ذلك كل هذا ابتعد عنه بشكل كبير وإنما توجه إلى عالم الخدمة والتبليغ المتواصل فقد دأب بشكل كبير على تربية طلاب الحوزة العلمية وخدمتهم بأي شكل من الأشكال ثم توجه أيضا إلى جوانب الخدمة الإنسانية العامة عندما كان الشعب العراقي يمر بأسوأ ظروف الحصار والجوع وقلة الموارد المالية فقد عمل جاهدا على توزيع الموارد المالية على الناس والفقراء والمعود يعني, مت... يعني معروف في ذلك الوقت ثم لما تغير النظام 
وبدأت هناك مشاكل الإرهاب عمد إلى تأسيس مؤسسة اليتيم الخيرية التي عنيت بأحوال اليتامى بالأعداد الهائلة من اليتامى التي يعني سجلت في العراق كانت المؤسسة من المؤسسات الرائدة والواسعة النشاط والكبيرة في خدمة الأرامل والأيتام وبالأعداد الهائلة حسب ما كان هو حسب ما هو موجود في الوضع العراقي كان من أهم ما يتعلق بشؤون المرجعية كان يحاول أن يسجل موقفا واضحا لا لبس فيه في أنه لا يعمل بأي شكل من الأشكال بما يثير الخلافات داخل المجال يعني داخل مجال المرجعية بشكل واضح في داخل يعني في داخل الأجواء العراقية ولم يظهر بأي شكل من الأشكال أي نوع من الخلاف في المجال السياسي أو الاجتماعي وإنما أوكلت الأمور إلى المرجعية العليا وكان دوره دائما داعما ومؤيدا ومساندا للمرجعية العليا حتى لو كان يعتني ثم كان يعتني يولي أهمية كبرى للتبليغ في خارج العراق فقد أرسل كثيرا من الوفود إلى العديد من البلدان التي فيها موالون ومحبون لأهل البيت عليهم السلام وفيها مسلمون ومن المسلمين أو من من الأديان الأخرى وحتى من 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 لا يؤمن بدين أصلا فقد عمل جاهدا على فتح مختلف الأبواب للحوار و تعريف بمذهب أهل البيت عليهم السلام من منطلق إنساني واعي وحكيم ورشيد في مختلف الجوانب التي يمكن أن يعمل فيها وهكذا استمرت نشاطاته حتى اختار الله له داره بل حتى اختار الله له دار القرار وشاء الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يكون ختام حياته بهذه الطريقة التي رفع الله فيها قدره وشأنه واختار له مثوا قريبا ومجاورا إلى مقام الإمام في داخل حرم الإمام أمير المؤمنين صلوات الله وسلامه عليه نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يتغمده بالرحمة الواسعة وأن يجعلنا وإياكم من الثابتين على نهجه ونهج أهل البيت صلوات الله وسلامه عليهم ونهج شيعتهم الثابتين الذين استقر الإيمان في قلوبهم ونسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن نكون تحت رعاية سيدنا ومولانا صاحب العصر والزمان عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف حتى يأذن الله له بالفرج الأعظم والله هو ولي الأمور أولا وآخر Alhamdulillah, we are all very blessed to have uh, an insight that is as such from the family of Grand Ayatollah Muhammad Sayyid Al-Hakim. Uh, and uh, Alhamdulillah, we, uh, we really thank the organizers for facilitating such information to come to us. As we all know, that no grief is greater and the grief of Aba Abdullah and Sayyidah Zainab. We are in those days when the family of the martyred Imam left from Karbala to Kufa, Kufa to Sham, Sham and now back to Medina after Arbaeen in Karbala. Let us lighten our hearts with the remembrance of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. And for that, I would like to call upon Mullah Sajjad and Kalwalji for Majlis Hussein as well as for the closing remarks for today's majlis. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-ayn al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya wal mursaleen. Khatam al-nabiyyin maulana abil qasim muhammad. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين المنتجبين أما بعد 
فقد قال الله سبحانه تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاسألوا أهل الذكر إن كنتم لا تعلمون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد my respected viewers, my elders, my brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This program tribute has been presented in detail to Marhum Ayatullah al-Hakim and I thank both Sheikh Alidina and the member of his al-Hakim family for an insightful presentation in the life of this great grand Ayatollah. We are living in times where there is that hunger, there is that thirst for knowledge. Unfortunately, many of us do not get access to the right ulama and we see a lot of things going around in the communities where there is a lot of confusion in understanding the right message of Ahlul Bayt salam. So this ayat that we recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fas'alu ahle dhikri, ask those who know, those who can remind you, give you the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in kuntum la ta'ala, if you don't know. I would like to mention a few tips to our children, to our youths. First is ensure that you do not depend only on social media for your information. Yes, there are very good sources of getting a lot of information, especially with regards to our faith, with regards to the foundations of religion, to regards of history. A lot of akhlaq is there. There are very good, reliable lecturers ulama, scholars on the social media who can guide you. But we should not depend entirely on social media. We have to come out and also listen to majalis in our centers, in our mosques, in our imambaras to learn a lot more. In that way, we can also sit down, form a discussion group with your alim, with your resident alim, and with your elders to find a way forward and let us not only concentrate on the religion, there are social aspects to it, there are communal aspects to it, there are leadership aspects to it. All this is very important for us to get us to that part of Ahlul Bayt alayhi musalam. Because Ahlul Bayt alayhi musalam did not concentrate only on the faith or only on the faith. It was the whole society as a whole. So this is very important as youths, as children. Do not depend, do not put all your time on social media. Come out of it. Sit live because now, alhamdulillah, the COVID times is behind us. It is not as serious as it was last year. At least we can sit down physically and learn a lot of things physically. And that will definitely touch our hearts. Number two, it's very important that yes, we want to learn religion, we want to be guided, we have to find the right person to guide us. And that is very important. Today, remember one thing, if we do not have the right shepherd, the sheep or the cattle behind will definitely disperse. Each and everyone will say, I know religion better than the other. 
I understand the Holy Quran in this way. I understand Hadith in this way. So everybody will find a path and suddenly we find ourselves dissipated. It is vital that we have the right shepherd in front of us. That shepherd should be the right scholar, a godly scholar, a scholar when you see him reminds you of the hereafter. A scholar, when you sit with him, you do not find him sinning. A scholar, when you sit and talk to him, he reminds you of the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt Musalam. He reminds you of the lifestyle of the Ahlul Bayt Musalam. He reminds you of that demeanor of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it is very important that you sit with the right scholar who knows the right things, who has the right information, who can guide us on that right path. And the path is only one. Surat al-Mustaqim are not plural. Surat al-Mustaqim is singular. And that is why our children, our youths, you have to be very careful because tomorrow the generation will be on your hands. The nasal that is going to come, the generation that is going to come from you, you will be the shepherds. You will be the guides. You will be their leaders. So sit down, ponder what you as leaders tomorrow, you as parents tomorrow, are you going to teach to your children to continue this legacy? It is highly important that the right guides are sought, the right scholars are found, we talk to them, we learn from them. That is number two. Number three, as you heard at the start of this program, ayah number 122 of Surah At-Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that do not only concentrate on that jihad. There is one other jihad and that jihad is a group of us should go forth, learn the right religion or rather the right concepts, learn the basics, learn the correct information from Ahlul Bayt because we are not scholars. Sitting on the ground, the community in general cannot understand what is right, what is wrong. They will only depend on those scholars who come and teach them. Now, if the need of this information is so high, then definitely the need of scholars is much higher. That is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, when a scholar leaves, to fill up that void is impossible. We can lose the whole tribe. It is not as unfortunate as losing one scholar who guides that tribe. Because that scholar, once he goes, that star, the Prophet says, is obliterated. We can never replace that star. So it is very important. We think very deep. We think very far. As a community, we have to look into this so seriously. Today, we have a handful number of scholars in our midst who are guiding our children. Where are those scholars? whom we can say these are our scholars, scholars from our community, how many are there? You can count on your fingers. We are so dependent on scholars from other parts of the world, from other communities, but we ourselves, we need to look into this very seriously. We need to have our own scholars who understand our own problems, who understand our culture, who can sit down with our youths, discuss with them, guide them on that path, and the youth feel at home with these scholars. So these are three basic, very important points I wanted to share with you, especially going forward, where we can see the need as we go on increases for the right guides in our communities. Because a lot of information that comes to our youths, to us as elders also, from the social media, a lot of it is not reliable. A lot of it has to be you know, investigated, has to be checked, has to be referred to other scholars. How much are we going to depend on that? It's very important. We need to look into this very seriously. Aba Abdullah al Hussein, on the plains of Karbala, he gave his life to save this Islam. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, before coming to Karbala, on the plains of Mina, he gave an insightful sermon. He talked a lot about the responsibilities of a scholar. He said how much need is there 
of the right scholars. Because if we have the wrong scholars, as Sheikh mentioned Alina earlier, those scholars are going to cause the tragedy of Karbala. Imam was saying that on the plains of Mina. Wake up, Imam is telling them. Wake up before you get lost and you make the communities lose. Imam is telling them to look after the communities. Imam addressed them, pled with them to stand up for justice, to stand up against oppression. But alas, nobody stood up. And those who came with Imam were only 72. Imam Hussein Islam, despite having a paltry number, a small number of companions on the plains of Karbala, Imam never gave up. His mission was to ensure Islam survives, Islam remains. If it is his blood, if it is his life, then he said, Ya Suyufu, Khudini, O swords, come and take me. I will give my blood. I will give my life. Not only me, I will sacrifice even my 18-year-old youth. I will give it, give in, give him away just to save Islam. Not only that, I will give all to Muhammad. I will give Qasim, let you trample his body. I will also give Ali Asghar, my six-year-old, who was suckling milk from his mother. I will give that away just to ensure Islam is saved. ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أيام قلب ينقلبون إن لله وإن إليه راجعون سورة المباركة الفاتحة أحسنتم تزادنك مؤمنين it has now reached a time where we have uh, come to the end of our majlis today. But before we all disperse, let us all take the time to call out to the Imam of our time, who is no doubt present at the majlis of his grandfather, Abba Abdullah, and who places utmost value in the scholar, in the ulama of Islam, such is the personality and the stature of an ulama such as Grand Ayatollah Sayyid, Sayyid Muhammad Sayyid Al-Hakim, that I'm sure that the Imam of our time is also present with us in this majlis in honoring his great scholar and his great student. Let us ask for the hastening of the reappearance of our Imam and pray that we are part of his blessed army. And with that, I would like to request Sheikh Abdul Razak if he could lead us in dua of Imam Zamana, dua Hujja, Shaykhuna Tafadda. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا قائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا
وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أحسنتم شيك عبد الرزاق and thank you all for tuning in a big gratitude uh, to be extended to our scholars who took the time to enlighten us today Mullah Sajad Ankal, Sheikh Ali Dina and the, the, the Sayyid who gave uh, a key insight into the life of Grand Ayatollah Muhammad Sayyid, Sayyid Muhammad Sayyid Al-Hakim. With that, we would like to bid you farewell. Brothers and sisters, thank you all for tuning in. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless your families. Keep us all in your duas. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.